Kia ora, Kiwi Kaja here and welcome to episode 48, Ma Taki Taki Part 5, Cast into the Wilderness. This episode will be more historical in nature as opposed to some of the more recent dramatizations, although there'll be a little bit of that in here. References are below, but I'll take my main thrust from Peter Hurunui's account in King Paul to To. After the fall of Mataki Takipa, there's only those left who are dead, dying, or who wish to die on their own terms. The abandonment of Mataki Taki results in 7,000 Waikato fanning out, wanting to put as much distance as possible between themselves and Mataki Taki. Te Whiro Whiro reunites with his pregnant wife, Fakawi. At Mana Ui Kapa, Te Whiro Whiro and Te Kanoa manage to muster a reasonable force and attack Napui Opi, sent out by Hongi. It appears most Napui return and Hongi is content to decamp from the banks of the Waipa and relocate into Puketutu. This is important as it allows Waikato time to spread out and escape. Power within 20 kilometres are filling up. People are being turned away. Those that have no luck need to consider their bloodline and other hapu or even other iwi that may provide sanctuary. Most flees south into the land of their ally, the Nati Maniapoto. Napui have cast Waikato into the wilderness. Let's consider Te whero whero and his wife's search for safety. Now, more than likely he's travelling with a small retinue of people, so even though he's the Ariki, managing to find refuge is difficult. He first tries Mana Ui Kapa, one and a half kilometres to the south. It's full. He journeys the 11 kilometres south to the large Maniapoto Pa of Totorewa. It's full. Possibly they accommodate him for a night or two. He's then directed to Pa Motumotu, a 20 kilometer journey west. Again, no luck, they're full. At Pa Motumotu is the chief Otupehi, a Nati Matakore, a hapu of Nati Maniapoto. Te Whiro Whiro asks if he can provide a safe place. He agrees to take Te Whero Whero under his cloak. Te O Te Pehi and 140 Waikato and Nati Matakore warriors escort Te Whero Whero 35 kilometers deep into Nati Matakore country to a pa called Orongo Koi Koia. It is here that Te Whero Whero will find sanctuary and stay for a number of years. His wife Fakawi will give birth to a son. He'll become the second Maori king. The Mauna Uikapa has less than an acre of the fensible area. Its population around 1,000. In the subsequent days, Hongi attacks it. It has hills above it within musket range. It's a sitting duck. No account of the attack is recorded, but you feel this would be accomplished with little loss to Napui and the complete capture of all inside. Now, Taki Taki becomes a slave prison for those that survive Manuika and the captured Ma Taki Taki refugees. The food stores at Ma Taki Taki now reside with Hongi. The extra burden on Pa from refugees is crippling. It's going to be a winter of hunger. Several months before, Te Whero Whero was defeated at Motunui. Now an even greater defeat at Matakitaki. This will be the longest winter of Te Whero Whero's life. However, there would be one event that would bring some hope. After the fall of Manaui Kapa, Hongi takes a large force across to Kafia. What he got up to there, Peter Hurunui doesn't say, but for those that had fled to Kafia, it must have been deja vu. Another force, under Hui Putea, of around 200 heavily armed Napui, goes south as far as Orahiri, 
which is near the southern end of modern Otorohonga and sets up a base from whence they mount operations. They capture a large number of Waikato women at Orahiri and turn them into sex slaves. If you are Napui, life is good. Intelligence reaches Te Whero Whero of this camp at Otrahanga. In fact, Hui Putaya's force surveils to Haupehi and Orongo Koe Koya Pa, but decide they are too strong to attack. Te Whero Whero and Otapehi decide to attack Hui Putaya, whilst Hongi's force is in Kafia. Here is a photo of the area in question where Hui Putaya camped. Here is the famous Kahkatea tree that features in the story. Here is the Waipa. Where it flowed in July 1822, hard to say. There are signs that it flowed around here, which would be closer to the tree. In early July, just after the full moon, a force of 140 Nati Matakore and Waikato leave Orongo Koi Koia Pa early for a 27 kilometre march to Otrahonga. They reach the area late afternoon. Otapehi and a small squad move off to reconnoitre the camp. They come across a Waikato woman who's in the process of escaping the camp. She gives Otapehi the layout and their routines. He convinces her to return to get the woman to engage in Apui in an all-night orgy and exhaust them. When the morning star rises over the Rangitoto Ranges, they'll be rescued. She returns to the camp. The attack force makes headwreaths of Rangiora branches, the leaves white side out, so they can identify each other in the dim starlight. As the morning star rises, the force moves into position on the southern side of the white Waipa. The moon has gone down and now there is only starlight. Otapehi drifts silently across the cold river and shelters in a designated spot amongst the reeds. A Waikato woman approaches and starts drinking. It's Rio Toto the wife of the now-dead Hiakai. He's expecting her. When he speaks, she almost jumps out of her skin. She gives the current situation. All are asleep. The women are grouped near the tree. Napui spread out around them, all sitting in their sleeping pose, their mats a warm tent around each of them. In horror, she hears someone approaching from behind. It's an Apui warrior, coming for a drink and to check on her. He kneels beside her, gives her a knowing smile and starts drinking. From darkness, Otopehi seizes the knot of his hair and pulls him under, wedges his head between his legs and grabs the thrashing legs and draws them under. It's happened so fast and with little noise, that Ryu Toto is wondering where the Napui has gone. Otopehi smiles at the whites of Ryu Toto's eyes. The desire to impress and attract a wahine never dies. Otopehi calmly asks if Napui sleep with their muskets. She says no. They are leaning against the kakatea tree, around which everyone's sleeping. Otopehi feels the warm, belched bubbles rise up his back and foam around his neck. He instructs her that the signal for the attack will be the second call of the Ruru. The struggling ceases. He says to her with a grin, I think he's had enough to drink, yes? <laughs> he floats the body and pushes it into the middle of the white pa. She returns to camp. Otopehi signals to Fero Fero and the warriors across the Waipa to join him. Otopehi takes five men, enters the camp, and quietly make their way to the Kahak tree 
and await the signal. The feral feral's force encircle the camp. The wreaths faint in the starlight. When all are still, he gives the first ruru call, then the second. They silently rush in with tomahawk and start the slaughter. The silence lasts but seconds. The blood-curdling yells of frustration and delight erupt. Those awakening instinctively make for the tree. Most do not see their death blow. In less than a minute, it's done. None escape. With no more movement, jubilation erupts among the women. The panting warriors enjoy the adulation. The pre-dawn light is used to gather Hui Putea's food supplies and armory. This is a great hall. 90 muskets with a large supply of powder and shot. Now Puhi heads are gathered and lined up facing Matakitaki. The heads of chiefs will go back for drying. Having some chiefly heads to harangue will be very therapeutic. Limbs are severed and stacked into the baskets for the women to carry. The next meal at Orongo Koi Koya will be a feast. As the laden leave the camp, Te Whero Whero smiles for the first time in a long time. Three days later, the news reaches Hongi in Kafia. He's achieved everything he's come for, and with Hui Putea's armory in the hands of Te Whero Whero, now's a good time to leave. He sends word ahead to Matakitaki to make ready to decamp. Eight days later, they leave the Waikato River and enter the Awaroa. They back full sections with logs, as planned, to slow any Waikato attempt to follow. At the Kauri on the Manakau, they camp and perform the first Whakatahurihuri ceremony. For each Waikato's chief's head, a symbolic hole is dug in a ritualised dance, the heads are lifted high by the tohanga and turned to face their home, the land they will never see again. The Manako is kind to them. They cross the portage at Otahuhu, then a clear run home. Missionaries record that the Napuhi fleet start arriving at the Bay of Islands at the end of July 1822. After a week, all the canoes are back. Hongi is the undisputed master of war. No one can stop him. Okay, so Pei in his book King Potato has the attack on Hui Putaya with the orgy, warrior drowning and the massacre. The micro details are from my own imagination. After this, Hongi does head home. Now, as a postscript, Hui Putea may not be a real character. Payne names him as one of Hongi's ablest generals, but others say the name Hui Putea is the name given to the massacre, and also to that area in Ultrahonga. I have not seen the name Hui Putea used by any of the missionaries in the Bay of Islands, so I suspect he is an invention. Around the time that Matakitaki is being attacked, that is May 1822, Te Rao Paraha starts his migration from Taranaki for the Horo Whenua. In the book Musket Wars by Ron Crosby, this battle at Hui Putea is the last mention of Te Whero Whero at war until 1826. During these four years, he is busy rebuilding the strength and regrouping Waikato. After four years, he's ready. Okay, folks, that concludes the Matakitaki series. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, take it easy out there. Stay safe for my Māori subscribers. Hei kōnā. See you later.